chapter 1. Uh, right after the book of uh, Nehemiah or uh, Job, you'll find it there in your Old Testament. Uh, I just want to pray before we get into this book. There's a uh, lengthy chapter I'm going to read it through. Uh, but it's a story, and a grand story, of how God works in our lives when he doesn't seem to be active sometimes. Let me pray. Father, we ask you today uh, for your gracious hand to be visible to us. That we would see the power of your hand, the power of your um, strength in our lives. For we know, Father, that when we least see you, you're still there. Because by faith you promise us, Father, that in the great commission you say, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And so, Father, here you are with us. When we leave here, you are with us. When we walk around the streets, you are with us. When we drive in our cars, you are with us. There is no place we can go that you are not there. Father, you are also there, not just in a passive sense, but in an active sense. You are working. You are active in our lives, in the people's lives, and in our, uh, our city's lives, and our state's lives, and our country's lives, and in this world. Father, we want to see you glorified and, and risen up, and we want to take joy in that. Father, strengthen our hearts. Give us joy in what you are doing. Help us to see with eyes of faith. Father, I pray that even in the midst of where we don't see, you would give us eyes to see. Your hand is still there. The power is still here. You haven't left us. You haven't forsaken us. You have provided for us every moment and every step of the way. We believe you will do that again and again and again. So help me, Lord. Help me today as we look at the Word of God. Help me to be able to be faithful to you. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Have you ever had a low time in your life? The answer is probably yes. We've all had low periods of our life, haven't we? It may have happened to you this week. If it hasn't happened to you this year yet, it will probably happen at some point that you will just have a lower uh, opinion, a lower time of your life, because we all question about God. There's always these questions about God in our lives. The world questions about God is, that where is God when they see all these difficulties in life happening? Where is God when we see the men's violence against his fellow man? I think that's one of the greatest problems the world has. They don't see God in the affairs of men who are angry with other men, who commit violent acts against mankind. They say, well, where's God in that? They look at the destruction that nature can cause as well. They look at the tornadoes and hurricanes. They look at the terrorist plots that we've seen even this week and, and the weeks before. They say, well, where's God? And I want to just answer you that God is right there. God is right there. He's always been there. He always will be there. Sometimes we just have to turn around and look. We're just looking in the wrong way. We're looking in the wrong direction. We're looking at the wrong kind of uh, way. You see, the Israelites were in captivity during the book of Esther. They were kind of in captivity. They, they had finished rebuilding the uh, temple. And it's about 486 B.C. Do you remember that day? None of you do, I know. But it was a time kind of like ours. You know, you look around the world, you look around America, and you say, well, where does God, where do we see the nation fearing God? Where do we see the world fearing God? You didn't see that in Esther. They really don't see that much today. But what we're going to find out is that God's still active in our lives. He's right there. 
What do we what do you do? What does God do when his people ignore him? Give him the cold shoulder, so to speak. When we, when we tell God that, hey, we got this handled. We can do it ourselves. We have no problems that cannot be defeated if we just have human ingenuity. You know, God has to teach us lessons at times that we have to humble ourselves. And it's amazing. It's an amazing thing that we do. How do you explain times that God seems to be hidden or silent or distant? Do you ever have those times? Have you ever prayed and felt like your prayers are just hitting the ceiling and bouncing back? Have you ever read the Bible and it just seemed to be dry? Have you ever just, you know, seen God just didn't seem to be active or be there for you? How do you explain those times? How, how do you make sense of them? Well, let me tell you, this chapter in the book of Esther can help us. Just how involved is God in our lives? Let me just say this. The fact that you all got here today is the fact that God's involved in your life. Yes. Amen. You know, driving here today, someone could have pulled out and just hit you, right? And that happens, doesn't it? But the fact that you're able to get here today, the fact that the car started this morning, a lot of people would say, well, that, that's, just, that's just science, that's just engineering, that's just good old-fashioned human know-how. Well, let me tell you, Unless God's behind it, it doesn't happen. Amen. Unless God supports it, it doesn't happen. Yes, there are rules of science. There are rules of engineering. There are rules that are physical laws. But guess who created those laws? And that God is upholding those laws all the time. In fact, if he doesn't want you to come here today, guess what your car is not going to do? It's not going to start, right? God, God can take your car, and you can turn on the key, and you know what? The steering wheel, you can grab the steering wheel, it could come right loose if he wanted to do that. <coughs> your, your tires could be all flat, right? Um, you just think about what would happen. You know, I'm getting an image of, you all remember the uh, show Sanford and Son? I just remember the junkyard, you know? Well, what could happen to a car? A lot. A lot. But there is not one detail in our lives outside of God's in the control. God's working. And here's the story. I want to consider the story. It's one of the favorite stories of the Jewish people. Jewish people love this story. And it was told during the feast during that time. We don't know who wrote it. But it was a wonderful story. And this first chapter involves a domestic squabble. Now, husbands and wives, let me ask you this. Do husbands and wives ever squabble? Well, the fact of it is yes. And here we have an example of one squabble that happened. And the king told her, the queen told her, the king husband, no. In other words, this was the first campaign of just say no. <laughs> and so we have this story that, that has people that we've never heard of. I mean, people whose names are hard to pronounce, and we're not even going to try to pronounce them. How's that? There are lawyers. There were servants, there were kings, there were there, there were there was this idea of a harem. There's all sorts of things that are kind of foreign to us today. But I want you to look at the first thing we see here in verses 1 through 8. There's a party going. There's a party. It says in verse 1, chapter 1, now in the days of Ahasuerus, the Ahasuerus who reigned from India to Ethiopia, over 127 provinces. The days when King Harasuerus sat on the royal throne in Susa, the capital. Here is a man who was reigning, and actually reigned from 46 when, when uh, uh, actually the Syrians came in and took over uh, the nation of Israel, or the land of Israel. He reigned there in the citadel of Susa. This was a hot place. Let me tell you, it was hot. Now, where I grew up. You know, they, they used to say in Houston that if lizards and snakes would cross the road during around noontime, they would just be burnt up. It was that hot. This place was hot, okay? Some of you, how many people like it hot? Okay, not too many people like it hot. How many people like it cold? Okay, some people like it cold. How many people like it just right? Okay, just right. What is that, about 80 degrees, right, year-round? We well, you know what that is? That's San Diego. 
80 degrees year-round, winter, spring, summer, fall, whatever it is, it's just all brown there most of the year because it just doesn't get any rain. But it was a hot place. And, and he, had a, he had different capitals or different palaces that he would rule from. Uh, and it was a really amazing thing. And he had this party. He called together a party. Now, you have to understand, here's the king. And what do kings like to do? What do rich people like to do? Like like show off, don't they? They like to show off their stuff. I'm reminded of a TV show called The Lifestyles of the Rich. You all seen that before. And when you look at some of the things that they have, like 20 cars, and the garage that they put those cars in is worth more than my house. You know? I mean, it's amazing how how people love to to just, just show off their, their power and their authority. Look at verse 3. Look at verse 3. It says, In the third year of the reign, he gave a feast, he gave a feast for all his officials and servants, the army of Persia and Media, and the nobles and the governors and the providence that were before him, which he showed the riches of his royal glory and the splendor and pomp of his greatness for many days, a hundred and eighty days. Now, that's a party. How about we have a party for 180 days? We do good just to be able to party for one day or a couple hours. We get tired, don't we? You know, just think of having the resources, the, the abundance to throw a party for six months. Now, you ask, well, why do you do that? Because... Probably all his leaders and all the people that were coming to the party couldn't come all the time because they had work to do. So over the six-month period, there were people coming to Susa, the capital there, the, where he was, and he was trying to, to get people probably to meet because a year later from there, he's going to try to attack Greece because this king wanted power. He wanted to show off his power and his greatness, but you know what? Pride was getting in the way. We see this later on. But here, here he was. He tried to, uh, for 180 days it said he did this. Now, it, wasn't, it was common that people would come to these parties. Now, and there were many, many kings that would have parties like this. Some would have 15,000 people there at one time. Can you imagine if we packed this place with 15,000 people? That'd be a lot of people. That wouldn't be bad if we were partying for Jesus, wouldn't it? But, but 15,000, one, one king said that in one day he had 67,000 people come to the palace. The kings enjoyed a good party. You know why they did? Because they could afford it. They had the money to afford a good, good party. And it talks about all the, the, the pomp, the, the pavilion, the colorful uh, Hearings, you, you see this in the, and how the wine flowed and everything. It's, if you look, read verses 5 and, and 6, it said, verse 6, there was white cotton curtains and violet, uh, violent, violet hangings fastened with cords of fine linen and purple to silver rods. And he goes on and describes the intricacies of it. Anybody has ever thrown a party, you know that you, you kind of have to get your place ready, right? Y'all, y'all, or y'all, right? used to call it, or I used to call it, or my mom used to call it, or people used to call it company clean, right? When people are coming over, guess what? Got to pick up your room. My mom said, is your room clean? I go, mom, it never got dirty. And she would look at me and go, right. So I had, I had to make sure my room was company clean when guests were coming over because they wanted to show the rooms off. That's what we do. We, we kind of want to clean up and put things under the rug or, or store things. You know, there's always a closet in your house, right, that you put everything into. Oh, the company's coming over. I've got to get it in there. But the king had the power and the splendor. And, and every guest was allowed to drink whatever he wanted. I mean, the drinks were flowing. And whatever the king had, whatever the king drank, everyone drank. Now, let me, let me explain this at this point. 
When you read a passage in Scripture, one of the things you have to understand that this is a, this is a dictation of what happened. It's a news coverage. It doesn't mean that it's right or wrong for what is going on here. When it comes to the activity here, it's just what happened. One commentator said this about it. As compared with modern storytelling, this presentation is entirely objective. The author avoids comment, attempts no character study, no psychological interpretation, and passes no judgment. The reader is left to make his own deductions. And no doubt, the original Jewish members were quick to do so. Let me just say, all restraint in this party was removed. Anything went. Anything goes. They ate. They drank. They made merry as no group of men and women had ever done before. Even the usual protocol that no one was to eat out of or drink um, or eat, out eat or out drink the host was set aside. In other words, they could do anything at this party they wanted to. It was a free-for-all. Now, the world loves this. Everybody loves this. This is not saying that this is what we should do. But it's saying this is what happened. This is what was going on. And I want you to understand that behind every story we read about, even today, God has his own story behind the scenes. God is always creating a story out of things that we think have no redeeming qualities. But you know what? God has his story. Even in our tragedies, God has his story. We see that here. We're going to see that here. Before us, a pagan king surrounded with pagan administrators is living in a pagan society. He isn't interested in the Lord one bit, let alone holiness. But even when paganism is around, even when people are rebelling from God, God still is fulfilling his plan. And let me just say this, too. We're in election season, right? On the 26th of April, we vote. Everyone should vote their values. You should vote your convictions. Not popularity, but convictions. And, and here is the deal. People in authority in our country need to remember this. All authority comes from God. All authority comes from God. There isn't one person in authority in this world that hasn't been granted that authority by God because God is in complete control. The Pharaoh had to learn the lesson in Egypt. Nebuchadnezzar had to learn that lesson in Babylon. Belshazzar learned it at his blasphemous banquet in Daniel chapter 5. Shennacherib learned it at the gates of Jerusalem. Herod Agrippa learned it as he died being eaten by worms. Every man or woman in a place of authority is only second in command. For Jesus is Lord of all. That should excite us. Think about it. Jesus is Lord of all. I mean, that should send thrills up and down your spine. That should make you want to get up and say, Hallelujah! You know? Maybe, maybe jump over your pew, say something to your neighbor, say, you know what? I may have had a terrible, really bad week, but you know what? Jesus is still Lord of all. He's still there. He hasn't, he hasn't gotten weaker over time. We look back in the days of, oh, it was a better day then, but you know what? God is still at the same strength, with the same power, with the same authority, with the same abilities, with the same, he's the same, right? (laughs) How much can I say it? The Bible even says he's the same what? Yesterday, today, and what was that? Forever. Forever. So that was the party. Look at the rebellion or the defiance. Verse 9. The queen Vashti also gave a feast for the women in the palace that belonged to King Ahasuerus. And then it says in verse 10, On the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, 
He commanded Mahumam, or Mahumam, and all those lawyers and all those people that were under him, okay, the seven eunuchs who served in the presence of the king of Ahasuerus to bring Queen Vashti before the king with a royal crown in order to show the people and the princes her beauty, for she was what? Lovely to look at. I mean, she was a fox, okay? I mean, she had it going on, okay? And the king wanted to what? Show her off. Show her off. And it was a foolish decision. A foolish, foolish decision on his part. You know what? You can only party so long before the party gets boring. And I want you to see this here. After 180 days and another, he also then after the 180 days, he said, okay, we're going to have another seven days of real good partying. And at the end of seven days, everybody was getting bored with partying because you know what? Sin becomes boring. The word, see, if you really committed your life to Christ, some people will say, well, then, then my life would be terrible. It would be dull. It would be unjoyful. I wouldn't be happy. Let me tell you, if you commit your life to Christ today, if you have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, who he is Lord, remember we've already said that, he is your Savior, he died on that cross. If you commit your life to Christ uh, un, un, um, without strings attached, you know what? Your life is not going to be boring. What is boring in this world is what the world offers, and that world offers is sin, and that world offers is rebellion, and guess what? It comes to an end. It doesn't satisfy. And I'll tell you today, only the Lord Jesus can satisfy your heart. You see what is happening here? He's trying to say, well, the party's going south, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring my wife in and use her as an object, just an object, of gratification. That is a wrong decision. That is a sinful decision, isn't it? That is a bad decision. And you know what she said? The first campaign of just say no. Just say no. She told the king no. Now, the king didn't like that, did he? Because the king thought he was Lord. He was Lord. There was pride in this king. There was, there was, there was, he, he became irate. But you know what? He had a domestic problem. He had a problem in his own home. You see, some people can control everything except for themselves. They can control everything around them except for themselves. This king probably became angry. You know, anger has a way of bubbling up when we become prideful. When we think that things should go my way. When we think that, that my way is the only way or my way is the right way. Have you, do you ever, have you ever known anybody that was always right all the time? Have you known people like that? Well, okay, Miss Grace. <laughs> Some think they are. But what happens is it, it, it becomes a source of pride in our life. And then anger comes up and, and we can't control our own selves, much less other people. Angry people can't lead well. And I want I to stop here and just, just make a brief comment about something that's in here. It's the place of alcohol. You know, they're, 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 they're drinking they're having their, their feast of alcohol. Let me just say, there's no one in the Bible that commands prohibition. It's not in the Bible. You can't find it in the Bible. But, let me just put a but there. But, the Bible doesn't emphasize it. The Bible doesn't encourage you to go out and take from the vine so that, so that you can alter your state of consciousness so that you can be happy. You know what the Bible says you should do? Instead of altering your state of consciousness with the, the grape or the vine or the fruit of the vine, you should be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Amen. Ephesians 5 verses 18 says, Do not be drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, 
but be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. And the only way you can stay drunk is to keep drinking, and the only way you can stay filled with the Spirit is to keep drinking of that same Spirit. We are all, as I wrote this week, we are all baptized in the Spirit when we are converted. We receive the baptism of the Spirit. We receive the indwelling of the Spirit. But we got to stir the Spirit up in our lives. we got to have it fill our lives. Every nook and every cranny of our, our heart's house needs to happen that way. Nazarites were even forbidden of drinking. And our Lord Jesus even said, he says he didn't emphasize it, but he said this. He says, for I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. You see, the king was prideful. And one of the reasons why he became prideful and one of the reasons he made bad decisions was because at this time he was kind of tipsy. He was just kind of wanting to have fun. And you know what? The Bible says that we should be drunk not with, the, with, the, with other things, but we should be in control of the Holy Spirit. I think that's one of the great lessons in this passage that God's, God's story is behind all of our stories. God's story is behind places we don't even see. And Vashti, or Vashti was right. Ahasuerus was wrong. His anger was only the further proof that he was wrong. Now let me just say, pride feeds anger. And as it grows, it reinforces pride. A quick-tempered man acts foolishly, foolishly, says Proverbs chapter 14, verse 17. And the final scene is this. It's the big question, where's God? In verse 13, if you look there, it says, The king said to the wise men who knew the times for this, this, for this was the king's procedure towards all who were vexed or versed in the law and judgment. These were kind of lawyers or astrologers, people who knew the law. Verse 14, it says this. The men next to him being, and you see those men's names, C-S-A-T-M-M and M. You got those names? I could say them, but then I would probably um, mess them up. Verse 15, it says, according to the law, what is to be done with Queen, Queen Vashti? Because she has not performed the command of, the, of King Ahasuerus uh, delivered by the eunuchs. And then Mamukin said in the presence of the king and the officials, not only against the, the king, not only against the king has Queen Vashti done wrong, but also against all the officials and all the peoples who are in the providence of King Ahasuerus. In other words, he was worried about how, the, how, how all the kingdom was going to deal with this. How, how's the kingdom? Are all the ladies going to just revolt now? You see, what, what the king had done was wrong. Queen Vashti was right. She stood up for herself. Let me just say this. And, and, and when we understand what the Bible says about the relationship of manhood and womanhood, it never says the man rules the woman. It says the man leads in a loving way. It never says that there is a rulership. It says there is a leadership in all of those things. Ahasuerus says, I got a wife problem. No, you don't. You got a kingdom problem now. Because you acted wrong. You see, if you think you can compartmentalize your sin just to yourself, that's incorrect. It affects everything in your life. It affects, just like you put a drop of chocolate. I'm going to say this. I use this example for, for filling the spirit. If you put a little bit of chocolate in milk, what happens? It still looks white. But if you stir it up, it affects everything. Well, sin just has the tendency to stir it all things up. And what affects one area will affect another area, what affect another area. You can look at our society, you, you can look at culture, you can look at nations, you can look at all these things. And he, he said, well, what should I do about it? What should I do? And the answer was, kick her out. Get a new queen. You see, that was sinful. Even then, it was wrong. You see, uh, James Vernon McGee said this, that, you know, some husbands are henpecked. And, and, and the one, one, he, he tells a story about a guy who went to work and was saying, you know, my wife was down on her knees before me. And one of the workers said, really? 
You sure? He said, well, yeah, she was down on her knees looking under the bed saying, come out of here, you coward. (laughs) You see, the recommendation is verse 19. He said this in verse 19 of chapter 1. He said, if it please the king, let her royal order go out from him and let it be written among the laws of the Persians and Medes so that it may not be repealed that Vashti is never again to come before King Hahasuerus and let the king give her royal petition, position to another who is better than she. Now what is happening here? Where's God? I, I thought you were saying, Pastor, that, that God always has a story behind our life story. Where, where is the story that God's working? Well, we're going to find out that this queen is going to have, guess what? Another queen who God places there for just a time as this. God, God, God puts people in our lives for certain periods of times, doesn't he? He puts people in our lives, we meet them, we might meet them at a grocery store, some things are divine appointments, some people have been in our life a long time, but you know what? All those people, all of our friends, all of our acquaintances have been placed there by God for just a time as this. You see, the Bible's very clear about that, I think, that we need to be, we are here for just a time as this. See, here, here's what he said to the king. He said, banish Vashti, get another queen, do it publicly, and let's say, let's just take care of this quickly and get it done. Let me just say this about how we should change society. The king is going to order an edict, pass a law to try to change this problem. Laws reflect the heart of people. The way we change this society, this world, this nation is going to be because the, what we sung about this morning is going to be because the cross of Christ is presented clearly, un- unapologetically, forcefully, dynamically, and joyfully to the world. They need to hear that the way we change is not because we're better than them. It's because we've been slain by the cross. We have been overcome by the joy of our God who died for us and took our place upon a cross and bore our punishment. You see, if we change hearts, our world will change. The power is not in the law, but in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's what we want to say, because God's story is always, always behind our story. Let me close with this. Today we're living in a society just like the time of Esther. Like them, we are the minority. Like them, we watch scandalous events occur in the highest offices of the land. Like them, we feel helpless at times, wondering, where's all this heading? I just want to tell you, God is not absent. We might not see him all the time, but he's, he's there. And the way we see him is by faith in the word of God. We go back and look at the word of God, even though we look at, where's God in Esther? He's right there. He's working behind the scenes. He's always been there. You won't find God's name in Esther, but he's there. Let me ask you this. When we we face adversity in life, do we think God is there? I would say yes. God is not just the God of the good times. He's the God of the bad times. He's the God of every time. He's the God of all times. He's the God of everything. God's there. We just have to turn around sometime and see him. And that's my question to you. Do you want to turn around today and look at God? Do you want to focus and look at the Lord Jesus Christ? You see, God is at work. He's not out of control. Remember I said before, Jesus is Lord. There is no authority other than God. 
Every person is second or third or fourth in authority. Jesus Christ, again, I say, is Lord. And guess what? He's at work. The world is not out of control. God has always had a purpose. Things just don't happen. They happen because God is behind the scenes working things out. We see through the lens of Scripture every single event in life being for God and for His glory and for our benefit as His children. Why? Let me ask this in closing. Why would God allow wicked men to abuse and impale Jesus Christ and put Him on the cross? The disciples definitely thought this was over. They didn't know what to do. Some, some, they all ran away, didn't they? they? They were confused. They were downhearted. They thought everything was over. Everything in their life was, was, was gone. But you know what happened on the third day? He rose from the dead. Our Savior is alive. He lives. He lives. He lives. And will forever and ever and ever and live as Lord over his creation. Why did God allow that to happen? Because he was behind the scene working things out for good. Working things out for his glory. The cross doesn't make sense only when you see that God has a plan. And it's to redeem us. It's to forgive us. It's to bring us into a vital and love relationship with God. So the question today is, do you have that? Do you love God? Do you love Him as your Lord? Do you love Him as your Savior? Do you love Him with all your being and power? Because He's there. He's not hidden. He's right there. So remember this. When life seems out of control... And regardless of how we feel, God is there. Trust him. Trust him. Trust him. Heavenly Father.